Hello and welcome. I'm Sona Kosla, Chief Impact Officer at Benevity and host of Speaking of Purpose. In this season of the podcast, we're exploring the history, stories, perspectives, and wisdom of Indigenous peoples. In episode one, we started with an overview of Indigenous history to help us understand the current situation of Indigenous peoples today. We talked about the residual trauma of residential and boarding schools and the resilience of survivors and their children. We learned about the ongoing effects of colonization, but also decolonization. And finally, we had the opportunity to learn from Indigenous communities as sustainability leaders who have stewarded the land and waters for thousands of years. In episode two, we traveled virtually across the world to Indonesia to speak to one of the world's leading activists to better understand why Indigenous peoples don't trust corporations and what each and every one of us can do about it. Today, our guest is Lourdes Inga. She was the perfect person to help us understand how philanthropy can be used to improve the lives and rights of Indigenous peoples. She has spent more than two decades in international philanthropy, specifically at foundations and nonprofits dedicated to Indigenous rights, gender equality, and social justice. And currently, Lourdes is the Executive Director at International Funders for Indigenous Peoples, or IFIP for short. Lourdes plays a pivotal role at IFIP in expanding Indigenous philanthropy by supporting the leadership of Indigenous led funds and advocating for improved funding resources for Indigenous peoples. IFIP also produces much-needed original research that's helping grant makers, also called funders, and grantees around the world connect and strengthen international support on these issues. Lourdes is kind, compassionate, and soft-spoken, but she's also strong and determined. She's been deep into her work for a long time, so it makes sense if she expressed frustration, but she doesn't have the rough edges you might expect. I think of her as a quiet warrior one whose patience and perseverance are her superpowers. Plus, she's an incredibly busy woman. She's hard to catch as she travels the globe advising leaders and philanthropists on Indigenous giving. We were lucky to have the opportunity to speak with her. In this episode, we'll talk a lot about philanthropy. It's a proven way to tackle big global problems and opportunities. But because philanthropy in and of itself contains power dynamics, One needs to be thoughtful about how it is applied, especially given the colonial past when it comes to Indigenous cultures. Let's get started. Here's Lourdes. Warm greetings to your audience. Uh, My name is Lourdes Inga. I am Quechua descent from Peru. My father's family comes from the central Andes of Peru, and on my mother's side, um, I'm a Spanish descent. I joined this conversation from the ancestral lands of the Maidu and Nisenat people here in Northern California. And as um, my current role at the moment, I am the Executive Director of International Funders for Indigenous Peoples, um, known as IFEB by our acronyms. IFIP is the only global donor affinity group dedicated to Indigenous peoples worldwide. We use the term Indigenous peoples, plural, because it better represents the fact that there are many diverse groups globally and not just one culture. IFIP's mission is to foster Indigenous solutions and partnerships among Indigenous peoples and grantmakers around the globe, and to transform the relationship between the funding world and Indigenous peoples into one of mutual understanding and benefit. IFIP's purpose makes a lot of sense when we consider how philanthropy can be rooted in colonialism and power. Consider how established networks, savior complexes, and power dynamics might impact the way we give. Examples of this include giving only to people or causes we know of, or only where our peers give, giving because we want to save others, or giving as a way to gain power or influence over decision-making and outcomes. Much of this manifests from a place of privilege, as we give or support Indigenous peoples in ways that center our own voices, perspectives, and preferences. Now, let's hear more about exactly what Indigenous philanthropy is and how it differs from Indigenous-led philanthropy. Indigenous philanthropy is 
I think it relates to how uh, we think about everyone who is engaging in giving and supporting indigenous peoples. It could be a foundation like Ford, who is doing um, grants to indigenous peoples. It could be a, a small family foundation. It could be an individual donor. And, and hopefully it could be people that are wanting to learn and starting their journey in supporting indigenous organizations. So it is uh, a philanthropy that's coming from someone that is from a non-indigenous person. But indigenous-led philanthropy refers to um, those um, nonprofits or um, community foundations and others who are doing grant making, but it's grant making that it's done by indigenous peoples for indigenous peoples. Uh, one example of what, how that looks like are indigenous-led funds. Indigenous-led funds are the nonprofits, or public foundation, or a body uh, within a larger institution uh, made up in its leadership and governance of indigenous peoples. And the way in which they're doing their philanthropy or their giving is guided by indigenous values in their priorities, in their practice, and how are they identifying together the areas that they need to be prioritizing for funding. And so indigenous-led funds um, do their work and they stand apart from other forms of philanthropy because it moves from the um, short-term base considerations that traditional foundations tend to focus on to long-term culturally appropriate initiatives that support and respect indigenous worldviews and concepts of development. The United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples recognizes that indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Indigenous-led philanthropy and indigenous-led funds actualize this self-determination because you have indigenous peoples directing funding to indigenous peoples. When they are deciding not only when or where the funding is going, but also how, while involving indigenous communities in that decision-making, it is an act of empowerment. According to IFIP, Indigenous peoples constitute the largest minority in the world at almost 6.2% of the global population. Yet, they only receive just over 1% of all philanthropic giving worldwide. To break it down further, in the U.S., that's just 0.4%, in Australia, that's 0.5%, and it's 1.25% globally. In Canada, Indigenous groups are receiving about $1 for every $138 given to non-Indigenous groups, according to a Canadian charity law report from 2019. These stats seem pretty dire, but Lourdes says there are concrete actions that companies can take to effectively support Indigenous causes and involve their employees and customers too. I think you have to start by making the conscious decision that you need to invest in educating your staff. Um, I mean, that's the first step, I would say. If any company is serious about starting this journey or growing um, funding into uh, Indigenous peoples, you got to start from that. That includes the leadership. They also need to be aware of what, that, what it means to support Indigenous peoples if you are really fully invested on, on doing this work. It means also creative giving programs that support not only services per se, um, like providing services, but it supports the deep work that is necessary in, in, uh, in the context of uh, Indigenous peoples. I would say again, educate and educate, invest in training, training your staff. But it also means uh, looking at your own practices, um, the ways that you uh, and your company or the products that you are sourcing or um, uh, profiting from 
the ways that you're engaging with local communities, if in fact you are sourcing certain materials from local communities, indigenous peoples, how are you doing that? It looks, I, I, it looks like more practically speaking, you know, are you compensating at a fair share how uh, those communities should be compensated for sourcing those materials? But it also looks like um, by modeling and practicing the principles of free and informed consent that are um, clearly um, one of the key things that are part of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous. So I would say so, those are some of the things that companies uh, can do. You can also invite a speaker to come and tell you more about the context of Indigenous peoples, particularly organizations where uh, you're interested to partner with. Um, but again, don't expect that speaker or the organization to carry your education. Um, there's, there's work that needs to be done by all of us and, and, and companies need to be responsible for ensuring that uh, you are affording those resources to your staff to do this type of work. One thing Lourdes really brought to the forefront of my mind is that Indigenous people's issues are everyone's issues. We are all tethered together. Our futures and our fates are intertwined by helping those who need it the most in ways that make the most sense for them, we're helping the collective. I mentioned this in episode one of this season, but one initiative Benevity created to take steps towards reconciliation was to run a campaign called Education for Reconciliation. The campaign rewarded anyone, our employees included, who completed a free Indigenous Canada course with a $50 donation that they could give to select nonprofits supporting Indigenous communities. It was a natural and fitting way for us to promote education, and it was a way for us to show that we care about social justice for everyone. And so, yes, it may seem daunting, but it's not. I, I think if you actually care about how society is moving forward, if you really care about social justice issues, issues around equity and inclusion, Indigenous peoples need to be part of those conversations. Um, they have been absent of uh, many of these conversations across philanthropy. And what we're seeing now is indigenous organizations that are now playing a, a fantastic role. In, and even though there's still a lot more work to be done, but playing a big role in many spaces because uh, we're no longer at a place that will sit back and let others speak for us, right? Um, it is now a moment for in funders, for donors, to be prioritizing the voices of Indigenous peoples, as well as the work that Indigenous-led nonprofits, Indigenous-led funds are doing in this work. Indigenous-led organizations also show us how and why giving must be done differently. IFIP has been from the beginning in the way that it was um, its origin story, right? Why the reason for existence of IFIP? It's about uh, really transforming a field and doing so by holding Indigenous values. And so the four R's of Indigenous philanthropy are based on our desire to um, and aim to transform philanthropy and particularly funding relationships to promote a new paradigm of giving. And, and the four R's refers to responsibility, respect, reciprocity, and relationships. And how do those play out in the work that we're doing, or at least the things that IFIP is asking? This new paradigm of giving that Lourdes speaks about is also deeply rooted in Indigenous self-determination. When we think about equity and social impact for Indigenous communities, the four R's gives us a framework to create empowerment and self-actualization of Indigenous peoples who know their communities best. We start with responsibility. Certainly our members, because we encourage our members to live up to those values, but also in the ways we are influencing philanthropy is that funders need to be responsible responsible 
for their actions, first of all, for their funding and the way their funding support or does not support Indigenous people's rights. And it also needs to be responsible for recognizing that Indigenous peoples uh, should be the ones speaking for themselves and are responsible for their own voice um, and their own um, decisions. Respect um, comes from a place of understanding of honoring traditions and respecting the ideas and, um, and the values of Indigenous peoples. It also comes from the sense that respect also means you're respecting diverse ways of knowing and the process in which Indigenous peoples embark in their way of living and in the way that they relate to nature and all living beings. Relationships, we talk about a lot about relationships because in the funding community, we see sometimes that funding mm, relationships have, tend to have a, a very short term period. Whereas with working with indigenous peoples, it means that you're going deep and you're going long term. And you're engaging with indigenous communities by understanding um, what are the priorities that matter to them? What are the most pressing needs um, for those communities? In order to make a real difference, People and companies need to be committed to driving change over the long term. And it can take a long time to see that change through. Companies, especially those only giving out short-term grants for specific projects, may not be satisfied at the end of the term. We need to commit to long-term change, which requires strong relationships so that we can truly understand the source of the problems and support people as they implement new solutions. And we need the time and space to iterate along the way. And reciprocity is just something that it's across the board in all indigenous communities, um, the, the a practice of embracing um, the idea of giving and receiving, that we all have the ability to give and, re and receive, either because you're giving knowledge and you're receiving knowledge, or because you are, are just entering in this value-based way of relationship with Indigenous communities. I think there is um, value in how we look at giving and receiving and um, moving away only from a place of building relationship because there is a funding transaction per se um, that it's part of that uh, way of you interacting between a funder and an Indigenous organization or indigenous community. Responsibility, respect, reciprocity, and relationships. It might seem like common sense on the surface, but these principles are key to setting the foundation for impactful giving in the context of indigenous philanthropy and beyond. Reciprocity is a particularly interesting one since we typically think of philanthropy as all about giving. This mindset of reciprocity says that everyone has something to give, which is a powerful shift that starts to deconstruct our ideas of power, as in the idea that if we have money, we have more to give in a relationship. From my perspective, this concept of reciprocity calls for an openness on the part of the funder to be more deeply engaged and ready to receive. In my case, I found that I received so much wisdom, energy, hope, and knowledge through this process, and that has tremendous value, arguably more than the money that is given. We can't finish this episode without addressing trust. Trust must be at the center of Indigenous philanthropy. We must recognize the power imbalance between funders and grantees, and take action toward rebalancing. Here are a few final words from Lourdes about what she wants people to know. Indigenous peoples, Indigenous organizations that were one horizontal relationships. And we want to be at the table. Indigenous organizations don't want to be an afterthought or don't want to be tokenized. I would also like to see that when donors or foundations or philanthropy, the funding community at large is talking about 
sustainable solutions, leaving no one behind, really doing that really deep analysis. Are you really not leaving anyone behind? You know, are you are you going to have sustainable solutions when you're leaving 6% of the world's population out of the equation? No, you're not going to have. Are you okay with continuing to do the type of funding that it's going to violate um, the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities? No, philanthropy should not be in the business of doing grant making that is not going to be taking into account how certain communities are going to be impacted by their giving. As IFEB, speaking as IFEB, we would like to see more funding going directly to indigenous organizations to do the type of work that indigenous organizations um, are prioritizing. We would like to see a shift in philanthropy, you know, so that when we do the next analysis of the funding, how much funding is going to indigenous peoples, we actually move away from the 1.2 to perhaps a 5% or 6%. And we're no longer what I refer to the blind spot of philanthropy, right? And a blind spot that uh, philanthropy has been okay with. It's been a blind spot for sure. But now that we know better, we can do better. Throughout our conversation, I realized that almost all the people Lourdes talked about who were leading the work were women. I was really struck by this, so I asked Lourdes if it was just happenstance or if there was maybe a reason. Indigenous women are playing such an incredible role, and um, if we even think, look at the data that it's out there, um, of the percentages that I shared, we see that we, even within those really minute percentages, a, a, a thinner slice of that is going to Indigenous women organizations. And we see that Indigenous women are almost always on the front lines. They are defending their way of life. They are defending their families. They are defending their communities. And they have this deep connection with nature, as well as they are doing it for the benefit of the next generations. And so when you have all of that, and, and you have indigenous women, for instance, from the Amazon seeing that the rivers that they depend on to feed their families are being contaminated, or when they're actually prohibited from going into the forest to source traditional medicine because all the sudden there is a new protected area that didn't take account the rights of indigenous communities to go into those protected areas to do the things that they will continue to do. Those are the things that indigenous women are fighting for. Women. Women as keepers of the land, as those responsible for the community, will put their lives on the line to protect their families, their people, their land, and their heritage. These traditionally feminine roles are seen as powerful. Lourdes helped me see that we can embrace the inherent power in these roles as well as fight for gender equity. Lourdes is a living example of one of these women warriors, and we're so grateful she shared her passion, knowledge, and self with us all on today's episode of the podcast. As we look toward creating a better world for all, we cannot ignore or exclude Indigenous peoples. By changing the ways we give, the outcomes for Indigenous communities can change. And perhaps in changing our way of giving, we will open ourselves up to receiving more too. To learn more about Lourdes' work and International Funders for Indigenous Peoples, visit internationalfunders.org. Speaking of Purpose was created by the passionate team here at Benevity, a technology and engagement platform that helps the world's most iconic brands bring their purpose to life, headquartered in Calgary, Canada. We hope it provides you with a spark of inspiration to find your purpose and your way of leaving the world better than you found it. Special thanks 
to Lourdes Inga for sharing her knowledge. To learn more about IFIP, Lourdes, and other things discussed today, look for our show notes or head to our website, benevity.com slash speaking of purpose. This podcast was recorded on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy and the Sutina and Stony Nakoda First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Benevity's headquarters is situated on land across from the Bow River, which has shaped this land and its people for generations. To listen to past episodes and get new episodes as soon as they're released, subscribe or follow Speaking of Purpose wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, please consider sharing it with a coworker or a friend. Thanks for listening. Thank you.